That's what we have. Were the officials correct? Well, let's take a look. Greetings, we're back in the studio for another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the YouTube show where we take National Federation of High School rules, we lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify, and give them back to you in a form you can take with you onto the basketball court. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official for over a decade. I consider myself to be a basketball rules expert. This show is all about helping you become a basketball rules expert as well. As a reminder, this video is focusing exclusively on National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. Before we get started with today's episode, have to give a shout out to show supporters Tracy Hounsom, Janice Brown, and super supporters Darwin Sonata and Paul Sullivan. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to be a supporter of the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There's a link in the show notes below. Today, we're going to have another lightning round episode. 10 quick questions, quick answers, down and dirty, correct answers to the play scenarios. Remember though, to stick around, I think play number 10 is the toughest in the group. All right, let's get started with our very first play scenario. With only a few seconds left on the clock, A1 attempts a try from the backcourt, which lands far short. The ball bounces near the free throw line and up towards the basket. The horn sounds, and then the ball goes through the basket. The officials score the goal, but rule it to be a two-point goal. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, what do we have? Player in the backcourt dribbling the ball, knows the clock is winding down, throws the ball towards the basket. The ball, though, ends up far short, but they've thrown it high enough that it bounces in the lane area up towards the basket and goes in the basket just after the horn sounds. Do we score the goal or not? What do we need to know here? We need to know that this is a try for goal. We need to know when a ball becomes dead. Those two components are really important here. A try for goal ends when the goal is successful, when it is obvious that it will not be successful, when a try contacts the floor, or when the ball becomes dead. Those are the four ways a try end. Did one of those things happen in this situation? Now we know that when a try is in flight, if time expires, the ball is still live. But when it is no longer a try for goal, the try has ended, then the ball becomes dead. So on our play here, the ball was live in the air. The ball bounces, the try has ended, and the horn sounds before the ball enters the basket. The ball has become dead because it was no longer a try. So in this instance, no goal should have been scored. Were the officials correct? No. No, they weren't. B1 is guarding A1. As A1 drives to the basket, teammate B2 shoves B1 into A1. The officials rule a pushing foul on B2. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? There's no associative property in basketball. The player who offends here on this play is the player who had the illegal contact, even though that was through no fault of their own, right? Their teammate shoves them into the opponent. The action of the shove are not penalized. The illegal contact by B1 is penalized. So in this play, were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. Team A has the ball in the front court. A2 and A3 set a screen near the end line. A1 runs out of bounds around the screening players and back onto the court and receives a pass on the other side. The officials rule a player technical foul on A1. Were the officials correct? 
yes or no. So we have a player leaves the court, goes around the screen in an effort to lose the defensive player, reemerges on the other side, and catches the ball, passed by a teammate. This sounds really familiar. If we had this same play, except A1 was a thrower and delayed, it was off the court, released a throw in pass, then used the same screen in the same fashion, failed to return to the court, but instead went out of bounds and then returned to the court and received the pass. That is a player technical foul by rule. But during play, when a player who's on the court leaves the court for an unauthorized reason by rule, they have committed a violation. And that is what should have been ruled. I believe in far gone times, this action was considered a player technical foul. No officials called it. So the NFHS said, let's just make it a violation so that it's penalized more frequently. So that's what we have here. A violation for leaving the court for an unauthorized reason on A1. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, no, they were not. Team A has a throw in with only 0.3 seconds showing on the clock. In one smooth motion, A1 catches the throw in pass and quickly releases a try for goal prior to the horn sounding. The officials rule that no goal is scored. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? By rule in National Federation of High School Rules, if there was a throw in with 0.3 or less on the clock, a player on the court may not catch the ball and release a try. By rule, no goal can be scored. Time has expired. NFHS says, look, human beings are involved here. There's three tenths of a second. These timer cannot properly start the clock in this limited time frame. So they say by rule, look, if we get to point three, the player cannot physically catch and release the ball in three tenths of a second. So by rule, if they do catch the ball, time has expired. So that's the ruling. Where in this case, the officials rule no goal. Were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. A1 drives and lays the ball off the backboard. B2 slaps the ball just after it contacts the backboard while the ball is still on the way up. The officials rule a goaltending violation since the ball was contacted after it contacted the backboard. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, we have a player drives to the basket, lays the ball off the glass, after they do, but while the ball is still on this upward trajectory, the defense contacts the basketball. They have contacted the basketball after it touched the backboard, but is still on its way up. Now, what's our problem here? Other levels of officiating. If we watch NCAA men, if we watch the NBA, the announcers will always say, well, he can't touch that after it's touched the backboard. National Federation of High School, ha that has no bearing on the determination for goaltending. A player can legally contact the ball after it has contacted the backboard, as long as it is, does not meet the requirements of goaltending violation, which would be ball having a chance to go in, ball on its downward flight, those components have to be in place. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, no, they were not. A1 drives and releases a try. B1, in an attempt to block the shot, slaps the backboard forcibly, causing it and the basket to oscillate. A1's try rolls off the still moving basket. The officials rule this a goaltending violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? 
a misunderstood rule in high school basketball. Player goes to the basket, lays the ball up. The defense, in an attempt to block the shot, swings and contacts the backboard forcibly. What it does is it causes the backboard to momentarily oscillate and along with it, the basket, right? The basket could move as a result of this action. The ball in this case rolls off of that still moving basket. The officials rule a goaltending violation. Commonly ruled that at the high school level, but the rules do not support that. The rules of high school basketball allow a player to contact the backboard as long as, in the official's judgment, it was an attempt to block the shot. If it's an attempt to block the shot, the resulting action by the backboard and whether or not the ball goes in and whether the moving backboard affected the ball going in, none of those matter. It is a legal play and the result of the play will just be the result of the play. Okay, misunderstood rule. I believe this rule may be different at the NCAA men's level, possibly the NBA level. I do not know those answers, but I do know this play is legal by rule at the high school level. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, no, they were not. With several players in the lane area, a1 releases a try for goal. B1, in an attempt to block the shot, gets off balance. In an effort to protect himself, B1 grasps and pulls down the ring while the ball is in the air above the ring in the cylinder. The ring returns to its normal position just before the ball contacts it, and the try is unsuccessful. The officials rule this a basket interference violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, play's going to the basket. Defensive player, it's, it, and it's congested in the, in the lane area. The defensive player, in an effort to block the shot, becomes off balance and is at risk of falling hard to the floor. They reach up and grab the ring in an effort to protect themselves but in doing so, depress the ring. They then release the ring, it returns to its normal position, but the ring was contacted while the ball was in the imaginary cylinder above the basket. So the officials rule a basket interference violation because the player was contacting or because the player had depressed the ring while the ball was in the cylinder. That's what we have, were the officials correct? Well, let's take a look. First of all, is the action by the defender legal? An off-balance defender, in the air, in the lane area, congested, players around them, are they allowed to grasp the ring in that instance? Yes, yes they are. Players are allowed to protect themselves in this instance. Are they allowed to depress the ring as a result? Yes. Potentially, yes, if they are at risk and their weight pulls the ring and breaks the, and their weight pulls the ring down, that is a legal play by rule in and of itself. Now, the ball is suspended in the imaginary cylinder above the basket. When the ball is in the imaginary cylinder, are players allowed to contact the ring by rule? Yes. Yes, they are. Legal. If the ball was on the ring, they cannot contact the basket. If the ball is in the imaginary cylinder, they cannot contact the ball. But they can contact the ring while the ball is not on or in the basket, but is instead up above in the imaginary cylinder. So in this instance, the officials ruled a basket inference violation. Were the officials correct? Nope. No, they were not. B1 attempts to block a layup by A1. In doing so, B1 contacts the ring and the net 
while the ball is in the imaginary cylinder above the basket. The try is unsuccessful. The officials rule this a basket interference violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, similar play. Basket interference is ruled. We have a player contacting the ring and the net while the ball isn't in the imaginary cylinder. But as we covered on the last play, that's legal, right? The ball is in the cylinder. They cannot touch the ball while it's in the cylinder. They cannot touch the ball while the ball is in or on the basket. If the ball was on the ring, the defensive player is not allowed to contact the ball. When the ball is on or in the basket, the defensive player is not allowed to contact the basket. But when the ball is in the imaginary cylinder and not in or on the basket, the player, the defensive player, any player is allowed to contact the basket. The way I like to think of it, explain it, is think of a bongo drummer. You know, they're like, wah, bah, bah, bah. a player could do the bongo motion on the ring. A player can, can rat-a-tat-a-tat with their hands on the ring while a ball is in flight. No rule has been broken. While the ball is in the cylinder, rat-a-tat-a-tat, no rule has been broken. That's legal, by, it's legal to contact the ring while the ball is in the cylinder, but not on or in the basket. So in this instance, the officials ruled this a basket interference violation. Were the officials correct? No. No, they weren't. During A1's free throw attempt, B1 violates by having a foot on the lane line. A1's free throw misses the basket entirely. The officials rule this a simultaneous free throw violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? B1 has a foot on the lane line prior to the release of the throw by A1. The official would signal a delayed lane violation with an extended arm. The A1, the thrower, shoots an air ball. What happens next? We have a simultaneous violation by rule. If a player from the opposing team violates and the thrower violates, we have a simultaneous violation by rule. Now, if we have first a delayed violation by the defense and the thrower violates, and if HS says, consider maybe consider strongly whether the actions of the player who violated caused the violation. And if so, disconcertion would be ruled and A1's throw failing to contact the ring would not be considered. But in this instance, it's pretty obvious a player with a foot on a, on a line is not going to cause, cause the thrower to be distracted. Now imagine other scenarios. We had a clip from a play last year or a couple of years ago where a player gets off balance and in an effort to control herself from falling into the lane, she waves her arms wildly, but ultimately crashes to the floor uh, in the lane area. Now, could that be distract? Now that's a violation. That is a delayed violation on that player, right? The throwers there, could they're, maybe they're cracking up or it's a pretty funny scenario, but is the thrower potentially distracted by that action? Yes, and we have to consider that. If we consider that they, they were distracted by that violation, we are going to ignore their subsequent violation, either shooting an air ball on the free throw or stepping on the free throw line themselves. Those would be ignored. We'd only penalize the defensive violation and the shooter would get a substitute free throw. But in this instance, that was not the case. Defensive team violated in a, in a discreet fashion. Offense, the thrower violated. That would mean a simultaneous violation. So in this instance, the officials ruled a simultaneous free throw violation. Were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. A1, after dribbling in the backcourt, throws a pass towards A2 in the frontcourt. B2, who's in the frontcourt, forcefully bats the pass back 
towards the backcourt. A1 catches the ball in the backcourt. The officials rule a backcourt violation on Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Backcourt play? Sounds a little bit familiar, but backcourt play. We're dribbling in the backcourt. We have team control on the court. Throw the ball to a teammate in the front court, but a defensive player bats the ball and goes back towards A1, who's still in the backcourt, catches the ball. The officials rule a backcourt violation. One of the reasons this sounds familiar is that many years ago, there was a National Federation of High School rules interpretation that said this play is a backcourt violation. Problem is, it was an erroneous interpretation, caused a lot of confusion, and the resulting correction a couple of years ago also caused, caused a lot of confusion. But at the end of the day, this is a legal play. Team had team control on the court, but they were not the last to touch in the front court. The defense was the last to touch in the front court. The player catching the ball in the backcourt is a legal play. So in this instance, the officials ruled a backcourt violation. Were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. Thanks for joining us today on Basketball Rules Expert. If you find value with the content, do us a favor. Hit the like button down below. It helps us with the YouTube algorithm, gets the video out to more basketball officials. If you have yet to, go ahead and hit subscribe and the notify bell. Also share the video content with any other basketball officials who you think could find value as well so we can all get better together. Cannot thank enough our show's supporters, Tracy Hounsom, Janice Brown, and super supporter, Darwin Sonata, super supporter, Paul Sullivan. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to be a supporter of the show, you can always buy us a coffee. We have a link above and we have a link in the show notes below. As always, we have created a quiz. It'll just be the 10 questions we've covered, but it'll be back at the website, abetterofficial.com. There's a link above. And what do you know? It's in the show notes below. We do have additional video content for you here. There's a link to our previous lightning round episode here and another video as well. Make your choice, choose wisely, and we'll see you in the very next video. Take care.